bankruptcy. This is what happens when a company is unable to pay its bills and then there's legal action either filed or threatened and the company enters bankruptcy. Now, bankruptcy is a misnomer to a lot of people. It really means something to protect the debtors, the, the creditors rather. So a company has a lot of debt. They owe landlords, employees, and banks, and bondholders, etc. And um, bankruptcy protects those creditors so nobody gets money um, at the whim of management. There's an orderly process by which we sort out who gets money and who doesn't get money. So I'm going to go through some of the provisions of the Bankruptcy Act. There are two basic types. There are some variations. Two basic types of filings. One is Chapter 11, which is, is where we think the company can reorganize its affairs, namely its debts, and uh, rise out of the ashes. The other is Chapter 11, which is liquidation. I have a kind of a blunt way to put this. The question to the bankruptcy court is, are you worth more dead or alive? If the judge believes you're worth more dead, then the smart thing to do is right away, just liquidate, distribute the money to the people as best you can and call it a day. If you're worth more alive, then the bankruptcy court may reorganize and restructure the debts, change even your contracts, change the amount of money you pay to your landlord on your lease change the terms under which you owe money to your creditors, your bankers, or even the bondholders. Maybe even change those debts into equity to provide you a more stable financial base. Those are all fairly desperate and extreme measures to make sure you're worth more money alive than dead. So over time, you know, even though it sounds like uh, you know, we're just hoping for something that can never happen, I can give you a couple of examples. Chrysler was about to go bankrupt and they reorganized and came out of the ashes. Macy's filed for bankruptcy and came out of bankruptcy and now is viable once again. GM, this is the, the biggest example of all, GM would have completely imploded based on the weight of its horrible profits and pension liabilities and debt, but they completely reorganized and are now profitable. Reorganization is complex, but it can work out well for companies that have just lost their way. So usually companies want Chapter 11 because they want a chance to make a go of it. And creditors may prefer 7 and just be done with it. What we have some details here also is that there's a reorganization plan. And this is how the judge has to decide whether you're, you're worth more alive than dead. So you file a reorganization plan. The court appoints somebody to watch over the entire process to make sure that it's done correctly and not either to the incompetence or, or bad judgment done wrong, and will then supervise the reorganization process. If that doesn't work, or after the reorganization consideration, it's not going to make it, then the court can always order liquidation under Chapter 7. So 7 is kind of like the, uh, I give up. Chapter 11 is, let's see if there's a way for us to work it out. All right, so let's say the worst case occurs, Chapter 11, and so we're liquidating. So this is the order of who gets money. And this is really important because chances are you're going to run out of money. So first you pay the government property taxes. Then you pay secured creditors because they were promised secured position. And we liquidate those assets that were covering it, and then we use those proceeds to pay the amounts to the creditors. Then the trustee costs. These are the people that work the bankruptcy court. They need to be assured that they have high priority of getting their money or they wouldn't bother helping the bankruptcy process. And then there are the costs of incurred after the filings. And that's because if you don't have those have priority, no one wants to cooperate. So let's say you're Macy's and you want to buy more clothing to sell during the holidays. If you haven't paid all your bills and if you're in bankruptcy, somebody may not want to give you any new clothing to sell because they're not sure they're going to get that money. So the way to induce them to sell you things is to give them priorities. So we move them up on the uh, payment queue, if you will. Then there's the employees, wages and whatever you owe to your people that needs to be paid. Then comes unsecured customer deposits, and these are uh, money you, you owe others outside your business, then other taxes, then pensions, then creditors, then preferred, then common. 
So it goes from people with kind of superior claims, usually with very strong contractual or, or in the process of sorting through bankruptcy, down to unsecured creditors and last, of course, our common shareholders who are, as we've said, the residual owners. This is where the residual word really hurts. The residual meaning leftover and in a bankruptcy, there's chances are nothing left over or you wouldn't be in bankruptcy. In bankruptcy, the liquidation occurs and unsecured creditors often get nothing. And so what that means is they have large incentives to cooperate because they have nothing to lose. And groups of creditors can vote on the, the reorganization plan. And so it, since the bankruptcy laws and the bankruptcy judge are looking out for creditors, what they say is important. And, and the one that, again, is the largest example in American history is General Motors, right? In order for the reorganization to occur, all those creditors from the top of that list down to the bottom of that list had to agree to reorganize and take a lesser position. So as mentioned, landlords either had their leases completely written off or were forced to lower the, the rent that they charged General Motors. Bondholders who thought they had nice secure interest payments and a, a debt position were converted to equity. So they no longer had a nice safe bond. They now were common shareholders. So bankruptcy can do some fairly dramatic and painful things to everyone involved, including creditors. Summarizing chapter five, we've covered all five of these key features of the bond, the, the five financial factors that are in every bond. And then we did some valuation to look at how to use present value calculations to calculate the price at the point of issuance or after issuance. Then we measured yield, yield to maturity and yield to call. And some variations we did included semi-annual payments rather than annual, zero coupon bonds, and also measuring as another metric to describe a bond, the duration of the bond as measured by years. Then we looked at risk, risk in terms of how ratings occur, how AAAs could have very different risk profiles than junk bonds, and then also look at what occurs when there's a credit risk and what happens if there's a default leading perhaps to a bankruptcy. That's it for Chapter 5, and I look forward to seeing you guys in class, and we'll do a, quite a few of these examples of traditional bonds and different types of bonds and provisions, and we'll do that this week. Thank you. Bye-bye.